Pirates of Penzance ought to be enshrined up there with the best of the movie musicals. Yeah, I said it. Speak out! I charge you by that set of conscientiousness to have never yet appeal in vain! A great movie musical needs artistic vision, a great cast, and, of course, a great musical. The witty little operas of Gilbert and Sullivan may not have the same grip on our cultural imagination as, say, Shakespeare or Superman, but allegedly there were 5,000 Gilbert and Sullivan performances per year back in the 1940s. Pirates is among the most popular, along with Mikado and that infernal nonsense Pinafore. In the early 80s, it was given a boost by Joseph Papp's star-studded free Central Park performances, which quickly led to this movie and also to the pirate movie, but better to move along. It is a remarkably silly story. On his 21st birthday, a young pirate named Frederick announces that he's quitting the trade because he was apprenticed to his pirate crew as a child, and now he needs to atone for his acts by sweeping them from the face of the earth! These pirates are nice guys, especially the swashbuckling pirate king played by Kevin Kline, so they agree to let him go. And Kevin Kline, you may love him in A Fish Called Wanda. It's kick -a -kick -in. Kick -a coming to kick -a -kick kill me! <laughs> How are you gonna kick a -ca catch me, kick -ca ken But this is by far his best performance. It's better than his Hamlet. His singing is great. He's just as funny as he is in Wanda. <laughs> But men. And his sex appeal matches his future wife, Phoebe Cates, and the stuff he does with his thighs. Yeesh. Anyhow, on his way off the boat, Frederick clues the pirates in to the reason for their lack of success. You're too tender hot. <laughs> they set anyone free who says they're an orphan. The last three ships we took proved to be manned entirely by orphans. Once on land, Frederick spies a bevy of beautiful maidens singing a song. One of them belts a solo out, which makes the others recoil in the cartoony style we've become accustomed to so far in this movie. But the cartoonishness pulls back for about two words, and we're treated to the singer's actual voice. And it is... Greet them gaily as they fly. Greet them gaily as... This may be the first time in the movie when the director shows his hand. He warms us up with slapstick, and then he nails us with art, talent, and sentiment. But it never lasts for more than a second. As soon as those notes are over, we are back to slapstick. <laughs> Back to the story, Frederick immediately falls in love with the fair Mabel. The pirates arrive to ravish the sisters, or something. Actually, they declare they just want to get married. Indulging with felicity in unbounded domesticity, they will quickly be personified, conjugally matrimonified, by the Doctor of Divinity who's located in this vicinity. The rhyming puts Dr. Seuss to shame. And the crazy rhymes hit their peak with the arrival of the girl's father, the modern Major General Stanley, who sings his insane theme song. In fact, when I know what has been by Mammal on a reveling, when I can tell a side of Mazda Rider from a javelin, when such a face is and surprised I'm a wary at, and when I know precisely what it meant to come and say that. Oh, when I have Loma Pregus to be made in modern gallery, when I know more of Texas than an office in an honorary, and show when I have a smattering of elemental strategy, you'll say a better mix, General Stella, round a horse! <laughs> And then he gets his whole family off the hook by claiming, of course, to be an orphan. Falsely. Now he justifies that. I'm telling a terrible story, but it doesn't diminish my glory, for they would have taken my daughters over the billowy waters if, if I hadn't, in elegant diction, indulged in an innocent fiction. Which is not in the same category as telling a regular terrible story. To which the pirates and the daughters, possessed by the spirit of an ancient Greek chorus, reply, It is easy in elegant diction to call that an innocent fiction, but it comes in the same category as telling a regular terrible story. Why is it what you just said strikes me as a massive rationalization? Don't knock rationalization. Where would we be? without it. I don't know anyone who would get through the day without two or three juicy rationalizations. They're more important than sex. Ah, oh, come on. Nothing's more important than sex. Oh, yeah? Have you ever gone a week without a rationalization? And then the movie, which so far has been utterly silly, swerves into this gorgeous apostrophe. The cast drops to their knees and sings a majestic ode to the power of poetry before concluding Act One with rejoicing and the waving of little pirate flags. I won't keep summarizing, you get the idea. The tone is goofy, the language is rococo, the performances leap off the screen, and occasionally they hit on a nugget of intense sentiment which cannot be delivered flippantly. Pirates of Penzance is broad satire with occasional barbs. The pirates are tender-hearted romantics. The Major General is an eccentric who's clearly unqualified for his job. The policemen are all cowards who mostly 
honestly feel bad about putting people in jail because the criminal could be enjoying a nice beach chair and a cocktail instead. Mabel and Frederick share a thick-skulled idealism that leads them away from love and on to slaughter, even of each other. But the danger can't be taken seriously any more than the pirates pillaging can. I object to pirates as sons-in-law. We object to major generals as fathers-in-law. <laughs> But we oh. waive that point. Oh. We do not press it. No, really. We look over it. Oh, well, um. The most dangerous person in the show is the Major General himself, who is lucky to know more tactics than a novice in a nunnery. When the movie came out, my young friends complained that you could tell that all the sets were really fake, which is a funny reaction to a movie about singing pirates. One thing this movie does brilliantly is the recreation of a live theater experience, which, ironically, the filmed version of exactly the same production in Central Park, with the same cast, could not do. My friends who've seen Hamilton live said that they had the same experience watching the film performances. When when someone sings a solo, the camera has to cut in close to reproduce the energy that the performer gives off live. You lose what's happening around on the fringes, which your eyes and ears can process in the theater, and cannot be captured on film. It's a tightrope. Fiddler on the Roof and My Fair Lady went for realistic filmic approaches, and I think they succeeded, while in my opinion the producers, or Hello Dolly and Oliver, tried for the same and felt a little weighed down by their moviness. Pirates of Penzance, like Bergman's Magic Flute, strikes a happy middle ground, keeping the stagey conventions while filming the action freely from all angles. As a side note, the list of people who performed in Pap's stage production in New York, in London, is worth a video all on its own. James Belushi, Peter Noon, Pam Dauber, Robbie Benson, Barry Bostwick, Tim Curry, Andy Gibb. At the time of filming, Linda Ronstadt was established as a huge pop star, and she was trying her chops at everything she felt like. She recorded three big band albums with Nelson Riddle himself. She dug into her Mexican heritage with Canciones de mi padre. And now she got to do light opera. She is pretty adorable throughout, and she pulls off playing a plucky 17-year-old despite being 36 at the time. As fun as she is with Poor Wandering One and, and that Taran Tara song, she nails the sad song, Leave Me Not Alone to Pine. That song is a kicker. Mabel and Frederick recognize that his duty to the Pirate King will stop them from being together until they're in their 80s, and the song's two verses are a plea and then a question. Leave me not alone to pine, alone and desolate. And then, must I leave thee here in endless night to dream? It sets you up for a resolution in a third verse, and the third verse never comes and that's tragic. In a less silly universe than Gilbert and Sullivan's, this would have demanded the third happier verse here, or at least at the end of the show, but we never get that. Which leaves this song as an aching wound at the play's darkest moment. The song ends with the words, Nature will sing day by day this weary rondelay. He loves thee. He is gone. Fa, la, la. But seconds later, they are joyously declaring that Frederick will be faithful till we are wed, and even after, with this infectious energy that makes you want to twirl around the garden with their stupid selves. And that's why this play, this movie, are so good. The film has no compunction against playing both sides. Is it tragic? Yeah. Is it hilarious? Oh yes. Is it a witty satire? Yes. Is it stupid slapstick? Yes. Are the heroes buffoons? Yes. Are they also glorious matinee idols? Oh, yes.